Hello folks and welcome to Weapons and Warfare from Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson. There is a lot to like in this episode, including a visit with two industry leaders in the field of AI pilots. That's right, artificial intelligence piloting aircraft. They've come a long frackin' way since the Cylons of Battlestar Galactica fame. Also in this week's episode, we check in with the folks at Anduril because our latest weapon of the week is their newest destructive device. All that, plus we address a couple of your thoughts in our comms check segment, but first, some headlines you may have missed. More than 50 defense leaders from Europe and around the world gathered at Rammstein Air Base in Germany last week to talk about continuing support for Ukraine in their battle against Russia. Among those leaders, SecDef Lloyd Austin, who said the United States and its coalition of partners would not let Ukraine fail. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not kid ourselves. Putin will not stop at Ukraine. But as President Biden has said, Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that it needs to defend itself. Ukraine's survival is on the line, and all of our security is on the line. The meeting comes a week after U.S. defense officials managed to find and use $300 million in contract savings to fund a new package of military aid for Ukraine. We have a wolf sighting at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. No need to alert any ranchers, though, because it's not an actual wolf. No, instead, the 341st Missile Wing just took delivery of its first MH-139A Gray Wolf helicopter. While it's not a new aircraft, it is new to the mission. The MH-139s are replacing UH-1 and Hueys to patrol the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Fields at Malmstrom, Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, near my old stomping grounds, and Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. You will convert from the Huey to the Gray Wolf at a rapid pace. And unlike almost every other Air Force aircraft, you will not have the luxury to pause the mission while you do that conversion. So embrace that challenge. You have an opportunity that few Air Force aviators and few defenders receive. So make the most of it. Commercially available as the Leonardo AW-139, the Gray Wolf is a 15-seat, medium-sized, twin-engine helicopter with a max speed of 167 miles per hour. Add to that a range of 778 nautical miles, and the MH-139 can cover more ground and carry more airmen at greater speeds than the nearly 70-year-old Hueys they are replacing. And it took a couple of years for it to catch up to the other service branches, but in early March, the Marine Corps finally dropped its requirement that female Marines had to wear pantyhose in their service or dress uniforms. Hooray for progress. According to a Marine administrative message dated March 11th, the wearing of hosiery with skirts is now optional. The change comes at the request of the branch's female members following a survey from the Marine Uniform Board. The USMC's last change allowed female non-commissioned officers and commissioned officers to wear slacks with their evening dress uniform. There are few professions as iconic as that of being a fighter pilot. From the historical, like the Red Baron and Eddie Rickenbacker, to the fictional, like Maverick and Iceman, or my favorite, Thumper and Chappie. Mayday! Mayday! Chappie! Iron Eagle is an underrated film franchise. If you haven't seen it, please do. It also proves that images of fighter pilots alone live in rarefied air. But just as the bi-wing gave way to the turboprop and the F-117 gave way to the F-35, so too will the men and women serving as today's icons piloting the F-22 and the F-35. At least in part. That's because right now people are working to make sure America's next conflict puts fewer icons in harm's way by giving artificial intelligence a chance at the stick. Essentially creating AI fighter pilots. This next evolution in combat is being led by companies like Shield AI and Episci. For them, autonomous combat-ready aircraft is the way to bring maximum firepower with minimum exposure 
for those serving to protect the United States and its interests abroad. For former Navy SEAL and SHIELD AI co-founder Brandon Singh, the need for autonomous combat aircraft is pretty simple. Every single unit is able to have massive organic air assets at their disposal. That's the shift that's happening. And why is that important? It enables you to have air superiority on every single mission, and that enables maneuver on the ground. What Fundamentally game-changing. FSI's Chris Gentile is a retired Air Force fighter pilot himself. He says AI pilots are simply the next evolution of American combat innovation. The fact is, warfare in general, and the American way of warfare in particular, is about using technology to realize asymmetric advantages over a foe. As Gentile sees it, those advantages are not limited to the skies. Whether that's a submarine, a ship, an aircraft, uh, a weapons launch platform, something like that. We want to continue to increase that capability, continue to make each human being, each American that chooses to go into harm's way, that much more effective, but use tools like AI and autonomy to manage their cognitive workload, make sure they're not overwhelmed. For most people, seeing is believing, and both companies have plenty of working examples of their technology. So why aren't they being introduced to the DoD on a larger scale right now, especially when near-peer adversaries like Russia and China, are working to bring similar capabilities to the battle space. It's not a technology problem. It's a budget, it's a resourcing, it's a programming problem in terms of getting this capability out as fast as possible. Once those issues are overcome, Singh thinks the change for operators in combat will be evident immediately. AI pilots paired with affordable aircraft is the most strategic conventional deterrent uh, since really, you know, the introduction of aircraft carriers. It comes back to can we effectively employ mass affordable weapons like the Ukrainians are doing, but with American control and American ethics? Can we have the right interaction with an operator that there's always a human on the loop when it comes to a lethal force decision? Earlier this month, Shield AI inked a deal with Navair to put their hive mind AI pilot in the Kratos BQM-177A, a subsonic aerial target used for training. And Episci landed a Small Business Innovation Research Award for an AI-aided satellite project that, if successful, will help sense hypersonic vehicle and missile launches. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left-leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. Time now for our Weapon of the Week, and for some of you, it might come from a familiar name. Back in December, on Straight Arrow News, we profiled the Anduril Roadrunner, an AI-guided drone hunter. This time, we're taking a look at a different Anduril endeavor, the Altius 700M. It can stay airborne for 75 minutes and has a range of 100 miles. The Altius is what's known as a loitering munition so it doesn't need to have the target in sight before being fired. Instead, it can circle around in the air, wait for a target to come into view, and then be sent in for the kill. It's a handy bit of kit for those times when you know where the enemy is going to be, you just don't know from which direction they're coming from. The Altius will take up an overwatch position, monitor the area until the target comes into sight, and then the operator can hit full send. Enduril recently released a video of some trials at the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. A release from the company says the Altius was armed with a 33-pound warhead and scored several direct hits. It's almost like a Hellfire missile that's being guided. Much like its predecessor, the 600M seen here, the 700 is platform agnostic, meaning it can be launched from land, sea, or air. It can also be containerized, making it an incredibly versatile and capable option for potential users. Speaking of which, Anduril has yet to say who is interested in adding the Altius 700 to their arsenal, but we do know the U.S. Army conducted a successful test with the U.S. Special Operations Command back in early December. A release from the Uncrewed Aircraft Systems Project Management Office 
says the 700M was successfully launched from a Black Hawk helicopter. A relative newcomer to the defense industry, Anduril was started in 2017 by co-founder Palmer Lucky, the man behind the Oculus Rift, which was one of the first commercially available virtual reality headsets. Since 2017, things have gone pretty well for the company. They recently told the Warzone they put $60 million into a new 180,000 square foot production facility in Atlanta, Georgia. All right, folks, it's time once again for Comms Check. It's one of my favorite uh, portions of the show. It's our opportunity to kind of check in with you, the audience, see where your head's at. Uh, we peruse our social media feeds, go through our email inbox, weaponsandwarfare at san.com, uh, to, you know, just kind of see where your head's at and uh, answer any questions, comments, or concerns that you might have. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first comms check comes to us on a story that we had done a couple weeks ago. It was actually one of our debrief segments about the uh, U.S. Air Force bringing back the warrant officer rank. Why are they doing that? Uh, to essentially keep some of the best and brightest in the uh, electronic warfare, cyber warfare field, keep them in the Air Force. Uh, the warrant officer rank kind of offers some more incentive, uh, more pay, uh, you know, that kind of thing to, to stay in. So... This question or this comp check comes to us from Texas Papa. Why can't the USAF use warrant officer pilots and especially weaponized UAV? The United States Air Force could have warrant officer pilots. There's nothing to say that they won't do that. Um, all that the uh, Air Force Chief of Staff uh, General uh, David Alvin had said was that the Air Force is going to start with, uh, you know, the, the electronic warfare cyber folks and and... Who knows where the where the warrant officer rank goes from there? Uh, actually, the the chief of staff, General Alvin, spoke at the AFA Warfare Symposium in Colorado earlier this year about this uh, very topic, which is why we did the story. Uh, but here's a little bit more about what he had to say uh, concerning this issue. We need to understand that we're still a force that develops leaders. And so we're not going to relegate the entire force uh, to warrant officers. We still have to have professional development leaders because this is one of our, especially in our enlisted corps, our professional enlisted corps is the envy of the world and it, it, it scares the jiggers out of the adversary. We need to make sure we retain that. So Texas Papa, hopefully that answers uh, part of your question for the second part, um, weaponized UAV. Uh, the Air Force does have unmanned aerial vehicles. Some of those are weaponized. Some of those are not. Um, if you're talking about why can't uh, warrant officer pilots fly those, um, there, there's nothing to say that they won't in the future or, or that they can't. Uh, they, they might, the Air Force might want to reserve some of its, you know, more skilled pilots for some of the uh, higher dollar value uh, aircraft or, or drones um, and some of these smaller value, you know, attritable aircraft, leave those for, for operators uh, to control. So, um, and maybe those operators, may, maybe they'll be warrant officers. We don't know yet. Uh, like General Alvin said, you know, they're, they're kind of starting here, we'll see where they go. So hopefully that helps answer uh, some of your question, Texas Papa. My parents are in Texas, so maybe you know them. Uh, next question comes to us on a story that I had done about the Houthis possibly having hypersonic missiles. A, a Russian news outlet reported that the Houthis um, have a hypersonic missile. Uh, this story is about how that missile is probably from Iran. It's probably uh, a, a missile called the Fatah, um, just because there's a connection, a very well-established connection of arms smuggling from Iran to Yemen where the Houthis are. Uh, this question from uh, George Joseph, the bigger question is how are they getting the missiles, the hypersonic missiles, in the first place, uh, hit or sink the supply chain? So I'm going to go out on a limb and say Mr. Joseph did not watch the story. This is probably a situation where he saw the headline and commented below. Because uh, like I just laid out in the story, we go through how there is a well-established connection between Iran and Yemen. It goes back years uh, when when uh, the Houthis were coming to power in Yemen, um, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, Hezbollah, which is an Iranian-backed uh, terror proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah and the Houthis were very, uh, you know, close, buddy-buddy kind of thing. Um, the Houthis got their slogan, their anti-America stance from Hezbollah, um, and kind of took a lot of their uh, wording and, and their charter and from the from Hezbollah's charter. Fast forward to 2014, 
Houthis try to, they do take over Yemen. They throw out the internationally recognized government there. They, they seize a lot of weapons. They use those weapons in a, in a civil war that ensues. They've never rebuilt the weapons manufacturing uh, abilities in the country, and yet they continue fighting. So obviously there is a, a, a smuggling operation to get weapons into Yemen to the Houthis. I'm with you, Mr. Joseph. Let's sink the supply chain. Uh, in the meantime, that's comms check. If you have something you want us to address, please leave it down below in the comment section, or you can email us weaponsandwarfare at san.com. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, time to wrap things up. And this week's topic is all about taking some time to live life and not getting too caught up in the idea of impending doom around every corner. So the idea for this topic came to us when someone on our digital team at Straight Arrow News pointed out a quote in our Russian space nuke story from last week and how it really resonated with her. The quote was from Elsbeth Magilton, a space lawyer and national security and defense expert. I'm summarizing here, but essentially she said, when you work in national defense, you quickly learn the idea that we're secure isn't really based in reality that there's always some sort of something that could wipe out humanity. And yet, we persist. Life continues. I mean, just in the last 60 years or so, there have been plenty of opportunities for world-changing cataclysmic events to have occurred, and they didn't. I did a little bit of research to find some stories where the world almost ended. Here are a couple of the more interesting close calls. German scientists were just about to field test some genetically altered bacteria in the 1990s, but thankfully, just before it was tested outside the confines of a lab, scientists in Oregon realized the bacteria had the potential to destroy every plant species on the planet. So definitely a dodged bullet there. In 1980, a faulty 46 cent switch almost caused World War III, because the White House thought the Soviets launched a nuclear attack. They didn't, but that did not stop the US from getting its ICBMs and nuclear bombers fueled up and ready to strike. Again, crisis averted. In college, I was a DJ on the campus radio station. Shout out to KRNU. I remember playing a song by William Shatner and Ben Folds called You'll Have Time. And the opening line from it is William Shatner singing Live life like you're gonna die, because you're gonna. And for me, that's the same point Magilton was making. There are things happening in the world that are scary, and yes, could wipe out all of us. But that's been true for the entire time humans have been on the planet. And hey, we're still here, still living life. And I want to thank you for including us here at Weapons and Warfare in your life. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off.